This is the Comics Alternative for Young Readers, a publisher spotlight on First Second. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative for Young Readers. I'm Andy. And I'm Gwen, and we're two people with PhDs talking about comics for young readers. And on today's podcast, we're doing something we actually have never done before. We're going to have a publisher spotlight, which means we're going to be focusing on books from all from the same publisher. And that publisher today is First Second. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that in a few moments. But before we get to those books, we'd like for everyone to know that this episode of the Comics Alternative for Young Readers is sponsored by Discount Comic Book Service. Go to dcbservice.com for all of your pre-ordering needs. There, you'll find DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse books for 40% off the retail price. Other publishers, you'll find prices and discounts of 20 to 35% off the retail price. Sometimes they'll have specials for from 45 to 50% off the cover price, and sometimes the discounts get even more impressive than that. This is so true, Andy, and this month, DCBS has some great bundles for our younger readers. Um, first of all, they have the Marvel Kids Bundle that includes the issues of Marvel Universe Avengers Ultron Revolution Number 7, Marvel Universe Guardians of the Galaxy Number 16, and Marvel Universe Ultimate Spider-Man vs. the Sinister Six Issue Number 7 <laughs> for $4.47. off of the cover price for those comics. And they also have a DC Kids bundle that has Superpowers number three. And then, of course, my favorite, Scooby-Doo Where Are You, number 77. And Yay! And (laughs) Scooby-Doo Team Up number 22, again for $4.47. And it's 50% off the cover price. Um, Later on, at the end of our podcast, I'll also have a list of some of the books that we've discussed today. They are available on DC Comics um, Comic Book Service, so we'll want to make sure that you know how to get a hold of those as well. Yeah, you definitely want to take advantage of the great deals over at DCB Service. And, And again, Gwen and I will be telling you a little bit more about those as we get near the end of the show. But for now, you know, Gwen, Andy, Kunkka, and Derek have been doing publisher spotlights on the main part of the show for such a long time. And those are really, really fun because you can focus on one publisher. And it's so interesting that the diversity of books that can come just from one publisher, and and we're going to see a lot of that diversity today, so many different types of stories and styles of stories. So today's publisher spotlight, as we mentioned before, is going to be on first, second books. And Gwen, I think you have a little bit of information about first, second that you would want to share with our our listeners. Right. You know, for one thing, First Second Books has a very interesting history. It was founded in 2006 by Mark Siegel, who's actually a comics creator himself, and he currently continues to serve as the editorial director at First Second. But First Second itself is is sort of in an interesting position. It's an imprint of a publisher that's called Roaring Book Press that's part of the Macmillan Children's Group, which is a division of Macmillan Publishers USA, which is owned by the German publishing company Holtzbrink. So (laughs) when you say that you work at First Second Books, you're carrying a lot of titles on your back there in terms of of people whom you report to, I suppose. But what's really neat is Mark Siegel actually grew up right down the road from um, where we are, where I am today. Um, He grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And when he was a young man, his family moved to France. And so not only is he bilingual, but I, you know, he developed a love of comics in France. And I don't think it's an accident that one of the features currently of First Second Books is that they are bringing over translations of a lot of really great um, French comics for young readers and for adults. So although we're not going to be featuring though any of those today because they weren't part of the children's fall catalog, um, I would encourage our listeners if they if they're interested in francophone comics to check out um, that. Part part of the catalog as well. But 
first um, second books has become um, also just a really strong supporter of graphic novels for young readers and really of a high quality, both in terms of writing and illustration of the volumes, but also of the publishing and print quality. They're beautiful books to hold on to, to look at. They're really amazing quality. And so it's exciting to be able to talk about some of them today. Yeah, they really are a great publisher. And, and you know, you, you really, I mean, we say this about a lot of publishers, but you really can't go wrong with First Second. There's so many great things. Um, and, you know, before we get too far, Gwen, I want to thank, I know we would both like to thank Gina at right. first, first Second for sending us review copies of these books. So, And she does such a great job of that. Now, we're going to be talking today about four books, but I want to mention another book that that has come out this fall that we've already discussed, so we really won't be discussing it in any detail today, and that is Mighty Jack by Ben Hatke. Mm -hmm. So if you've been listening to the show, you know that we already discussed it in our August program, and I'll provide the link to that in the show notes. But um, even though Mighty Jack has already come out and we've already discussed it, uh, and we won't be going into detail here. I did want people to know about that one. Definitely don't want to miss Mighty Jack. Yeah, and from a thematic perspective, it really does have a lot in common with at least three of the titles we're going to talk about today. Um, there's mm -hmm. some monstrous mystery going on in Mighty Jack that is also present in a lot of the books uh, that we're going to talk about. So Mighty Jack is a great text. I, I want to second what Andy said, and uh, we'll look forward to, to hearing what maybe many of you have to say about not only the books we're going to talk about, about today, but about Mighty Jack. That's right. Well, and our first book that we're going to talk about today is called Varmints, and this is by Andy Hirsch. And Andy is an artist that lives in the Dallas, Texas area. In fact, he's friends with our fearless leader, Derek Royal. Wow. And he's, he's co-creator of a book called The Baker Street Peculiars. Which and I love. Yep, yep. An illustrator of a graphic novel, The Royal Historian of Oz. And, you know, I haven't read that one yet, but Andy's also done a lot of work contributing to Garfield, Regular Show, Adventure Time, those ongoing comic series. And Varmints is Andy's first graphic novel. Wow. Well, to, to give listeners a little idea about this, this is a story that's set in the Old West, and it's a sister and brother named Opie and Ned, and they're looking for the man who shot their mom, or in Western parlance, their ma. <laughs> and it's a wonder that they can focus Gwen on any goal at all, since they're constantly squabbling and fighting with each other. I mean, this is sibling <laughs> rivalry taken to the, to the extreme. And and along the way, they hear of the mysterious Pa, the crime kingpin of the West, and they want to go after him too. Well. You know, we don't want to tell you too much about Varmints, other than it is a, a sibling rivalry type of book. It is a Western. It's very fast-paced. I think for us to go through the plot would be pointless because it just it never stops and there's so much in it that changes there's a lot of humor it's loaded with a lot of gags um and a lot of a lot of kind of tongue-in-cheek type of things and kind of wink wink nod nod type of humor some of those things are things like there's a scene where they're they're chasing someone through a town and there's a store that says dry goods and then the one next to it says wet goods <laughs> right <laughs> you know things like that there's a there's a guy that has horses and it's called called Jim's pre-owned horses. So there's a there's a lot of, you know, light fun humor in that. And and these are the book is separated into seven chapters. And and again, it's extremely fast-paced. It's this is a very very action-driven book. And again, a lot of the book is about siblings trying to work together in hectic frantic situations and having adventures and and there are so many dangerous situations and narrow escapes that it's really dizzying and there's there's a whole plethora of characters that come and go but but again if, if you really want if you like westerns and if you like action 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 you're gonna <laughs> enjoy varmints well andy it reminds me a little bit of a book that we talked about earlier this summer compass south that's by hope larson and rebecca mock and mm -hmm. Remember, that was a text that was set in the American um, 
basically not the American West, it's the American South, but the characters are moving out West. And it's two sets of siblings who also have to learn to work both with each other and then across team, if you will, um, in order to, to achieve um, uh, a reunion in their mind with, with family. And so in that respect, I saw this comic as being a nice, perhaps accompaniment for a reader who enjoyed Compass South. This might be the next one that I would point them to. Yeah, it would. And, and you know, the colors are are very vibrant. I mean, there is so much great color work in this book. Um, but again, if you're looking for a really fast-paced adventure set in the Old West, I think you'll enjoy Varmints. And it's also gender bending, which is nice. Um, or at least yeah. it's dealing with the very familiar tomboy figure um, in Opie. And her relationship with Ned, even though there's a lot of sibling rivalry, you can you can see that there's an undercurrent there of love that they have for each other, and they're in a really very complicated situation. I do agree with Andy that we don't want to give away too much of the plot because this is actually a very plot driven narrative, and I will say also if you like horses, the horses in this text are not only central to the plot. But they sometimes have the best gags. <laughs> they they really seem to know what's what's going on, and uh, and as much as the humans do, and they they have the, their opinions, and so it's a it's a really quite funny funny book in that respect. Definitely so. Well, Gwen, um, do you want to tell us about the next book that we're going to be taking a look at, Quirk's Quest? Absolutely. Now, this is a very interesting book. Um, Andy, when I was in um, in sort of the last couple of years of high school, first years of college, my best friend and I used to write fiction together. And we would, we would, I would write a segment, she would write a segment. We created these entire story worlds that were pretty elaborate. Now, remember, this was back in the early 1980s when we barely had a phonograph and, and we had to dial a telephone on a rotary. <laughs> no, um, not yes, a dial. That, that, we had a dial phone in my kitchen and it, that was the only phone. So, and it was in the kitchen. So, you know, those mm-hmm. were the days, but. Um, my best friend and I really enjoy doing that. And I've often said to her jokingly, we should, we should go find those and, and see if there's anything in there. Well, that's what's really interesting about the next text that we're going to talk about because it's written by friends who knew each other in middle school. So they have known each other for an incredibly long time. And it's really exciting to think that, you know, they created a story world together and they, they both went into comics and illustration. And we now have the the first volume, but it's for them. For it's new to us, but for them, they've known this this story world a really long time. So this is Robert Christie and Deborah Lang. And uh, what's really neat is that this is a book that, it, in some ways, is it follows a very traditional quest narrative. You have um, this the sea captain um, and Captain Quirk is, which is a great name, by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <it is. laughs> and uh, and he is going on this uh, adventure at the at the behest of um, a king in order to. Uh, find new lands, explore them, and he has a whole crew with him, and each of them has a particular um, task in mind. And it's at this point that I'm going to say to my, to my reader friends that you really need to make use of the book's cast of characters page, which is towards the end. Because mm-hmm. after, like, about halfway through, I figured out who everyone was, and I had no trouble, and I didn't have to consult it. But it is really super useful. And so let me just talk briefly about some of these characters. Because, first of all, there is Captain um, Quinta Rindy Kirk, who's the mission leader. And then um, there's uh, Nursel Bukube, who's the royal cartographer, who's going to draw maps of this place that they go. There's Bertram, the ecologist, who is sort of like the Debbie Downer of the mission. He's <laughs> <laughs> he's a contrarian. He's always upset. Things just don't work out for him. And he has a little assistant called Waldemar. And then there are so many other characters, but one who comes to the fore is Smoke, 
or Smock, I guess is his name. He's mm-hmm. a kitchen assistant. And typically in a text like this, the kitchen assistant is not really the protagonist. But as we find, he has wonderful common sense. And when the going gets rough, he's actually someone whom the captain comes to depend upon. On top of that, they're, they're traveling with these brigades who are there to protect them. And they are what they call Serbian frog brigades. And these are these Kermit the (laughs) Frog-esque. Okay, I not only love them, but some of them are women. And the first woman who's who's pictured is named Gwen. So (laughs) (laughs) thank you very much, Robert Christie and Deborah Lane, because I now can like have a new profile picture. Um, (laughs) But the point is that these characters are are, um, on this quest and unfortunately, almost immediately find themselves in a whole heap of trouble. They they land at a place that we later learn is called Crotonia. And it is a beautiful place with lots of interesting vegetation and inhabitants. But unfortunately, the first inhabitants whom they meet are these giants with multiple eyeballs who come and basically take the ship and use it as a plaything. They're so large that the ship ends up looking like a little toy that a kid would play with in a bathtub. And um, the various characters are... Uh, Basically, they fall out of the ship, they get to the shore, and there's there's some casualties, and they end up in a cave, and that cave is home to a very mysterious person who, it turns out, has some ulterior motives. And so, ha, huh, I'm taking a deep breath. There's a lot that happens in this comic, and I would say that just from a visual perspective, because, you know, we just talked about varmints, which is, uh, uh, you know, it's it's a very fanciful comic in many ways, but it's focused entirely in the real world with with human characters. In this text, all of the characters are differently drawn, but they look like Muppets, almost mm-hmm. like almost mm-hmm. like um, I was thinking of Fraggle Rock came to mind yes. that yes. mid nineteen eighties childhood show, um, and there it's a very very diverse cast of characters, and they all really look pretty different from each other, wouldn't you say? I would. And, you know, I, I picked up on the Jim Henson kind of lookalikes, too. And I thought Fraggle Rock was the first thing I thought of as well. And um, I, I think those comparisons are inevitable. But, you know, after looking at a couple of interviews that the creators gave, they weren't they weren't consciously uh, influenced by Henson's work. But, you know, I noticed just a bit of The Simpsons thrown in there, too. And I saw uh, Dr. Zeus. I, I put in my notes. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. But, yeah. But, but I don't want our, our listeners to think that that makes this a derivative comic, because really there's a lot that's very unique to it. It's just mm-hmm. that these characters are in that cast, right? Yeah. And and I think one of the things that makes this this comic so unusual is that you have these characters that do look somewhat Jim Henson like and cute and cuddly, but there's also real danger here. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and, you know, we normally don't associate serious danger with Jim Henson type of things, unless we're talking about something like the dark crystal or something much darker. So you do have that. But one of the things that I really, really like about this is, you know, not everybody is perfect. Uh, Not everybody uh, does things the right way. For instance, the captain, Captain Quirk, um, the the entire book really starts as his travel journal as he's describing this expedition. And really, once we get into it, we see that Quirk is really kind of full of himself. (laughs) And, And he... And he lands them into danger early on, but he feels really confident that he can get out them out of whatever danger that they come across. But he does, you know, he does have some um, some some importance issues of, of you know with himself. Okay, yeah, because I want to quote from the text for a minute. Um, at one point, things are not going well on many fronts for these poor explorers, and Captain Quirk says, "Why is it that my glory?" is so hard to obtain, that my brilliance is squandered on this unrelenting cycle of misery and misfortune. That's one panel. And then the next Mm -hmm. 
three panels are of the the little frog warriors and smock just kind of looking at him like do you really think that's the biggest thing that we're <laughs> right. dealing with right now it's totally silent a series of silent panels but their looks are just priceless and so even though he's very full of himself clearly the people who surround him have a pretty good idea that that is the case <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I think that makes that so much more of an interesting book because you've got a, a character that, that is, has conflict, that has multiple, um, motivations going on. And, and, you know, that's the real world is like that too. And, and to put this in a comic that, that, you know, and, you know it looks kind of like, and it feels kind of like a Lewis and Clark type of adventure, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're exploring and, and uh, so it's it's good to get these type of characters. The one thing that that I think we we both really like about this is, like you said, the creators have spent a lot of time creating this world and its characters, and and that really does come across. And I would I would say you know if the book has a weakness, and I'm not really saying that this is so much a weakness, but there's so much of the world that the creators know that we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they obviously know the world up and down, backwards and forwards, and, and we're being told a little bit of it at a time. I, I think this is a really compelling book. Um, I, I, I hope that it finds an audience. And, and again, I want to refer back to a, an interview that I was reading with, with the creators, and um, it was from Deborah Lang. She said that when, when they were writing this, their original audience they they tried to think of things that the, each other would find amusing, and they wrote stories that they thought would be humorous. But they said, with any, as with any adventure story, there's the potential for danger and violence. At the same time, uh, they wanted it to be sort of kind of like a, a documentary, like a whole you know things getting eaten, circle of life type of story too. <laughs> You know, which which I thought was really interesting. And the interesting thing I think about it too is Deborah Lang is. Um, is a scientific illustrator and a molecular biologist. So I thought that was really interesting because that lends a whole new aspect to it. Um, and then Robert Christie wrote in that same interview that, that they wrote Quirk's Quest to be an all ages book by default, mainly because when they started writing it, they were kids themselves and they were kind of writing it for each other. And then they never really thought, well, who's the target audience? And and in a way, I think that's a strength of the book, and not not a weakness. That that you know, it it does have a, it can reach a a younger audience, but it can reach a a more you know older audience as well. Well, many of the dynamics remind me of the British and then American sitcom The Office. Mm -hmm. Um, and and so I do think that if a parent were to get this book and read it to their child or with their child, they would find some things in it that were funny. I I do want to say too though that um that the traditional hierarchies that one often finds in texts that focus on this sort of quest they are present in the text and there is a clear chain of command and the imperatives of the explorers in this text are primary, including the naming and classification of species, which now makes a little more sense since Deborah Lang is a biologist and right. the co-opting of so-called friendly inhabitants to help take um, on and fight the less friendly ones. Now these passengers uh, who are on the ship are, of course, marooned. So um, it's clear that they're going to have contact with people once they're stuck on this island. But it's, I think, it's important that we note that there is sort of not only is the captain obsessed with legacy and with status, but his voice provides a significant portion of the narration through his captain's log. Although there is another omniscient narrator, so so mm -hmm. it's not as if his is the only viewpoint through which we see the text, but. It's clear, too, that um, even though Smock is the brains of the operation, it's not really until the end of the text that he wakes up to the fact that the captain maybe doesn't always have the best ideas. Mm -hmm. And it's clear, too, that a lot of the language in this text um, is still sort of the language of exploration. And, you know, we're living in a time now where we're beginning to rethink the exploration narrative itself. Um, we just had what is known as Columbus Day recently, but in some places that day has now been changed to Indigenous Peoples Day. And so while this book is very sweet and these aren't human beings, these are animals, and it is a very definitely a fantasy context, 
some of the imperatives of exploration are really never questioned in this text. And I just wanted to point that out, um, that, that that is there. And, um, but on the other hand, there are ways in which this text calls those things into question as well. And especially, I think, if we look at the captain as sort of the epitome of the old world hierarchy, etc., by the end of the text, it's pretty clear that there are a lot of other characters who are truly leading this expedition, regardless of what the captain's log says. And two, we get the sense that this is you know, perhaps the first volume in maybe a series. Right. I don't want to talk about, yeah, I don't want to talk about the ending, but, um, you know, it looks like that we might have more Quirk's Quest volumes coming out. And I think that was, that would be a very good thing. Yeah. And I'm sure that they're going to continue to address those issues. This was a very enjoyable read and some, some points of it are laugh out loud funny, but there are other yeah. points that yeah. are really poignant. And, um, and the pacing is a little slower than varmints. So, um, you know, there, there's, I think, a little bit of time for the characters to reflect. I think the, the movement here, because the, the plot follows such a predictable, traditional castaways type plot, there's a little more room for character development. And so you can see characters, many of them actually, change over the course of the narrative, or you learn a lot more about their motivations. Mm-hmm. And Gwen, I would I would just say not really a warning, but a suggestion for for parents if you're going to get this book for uh, a very young reader. Again, as as Gwen mentioned, some of the names are are kind of challenging. There are a lot of names to keep up with, but there are there's kind of a glossary of characters in the back with their their pictures and their names. So if if your young reader is struggling a bit with the names, they can always refer back to the the character names. Um, so there may be a little bit of challenge with this book as far as that goes, but I think it definitely is worth reading. Absolutely, and I just want to mention really briefly too, Andy, that this is the first of now three narratives from first second that focus on monsters and one of the characters that we haven't mentioned yet in quirk's quest is a witch or at least Mm -hmm. a sorceress someone with magical powers her name is hecka and she's a central feature of this text as are a lot of creatures that as you said have names that are hard to pronounce (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and or at least you really have to think about it. Um, yeah. And so that's something to that I was thinking about. If I were working at first, second books over the last year, I would be very familiar at, by this point with witches and um, sorcerers and ma- magicians and and goblins and ghosts and everything else. So it's been probably quite a, a magical time over there in first, second books. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, and that that should be a a, a good segue into our next book, which is called Bera. At least I'm calling it Bera, mm-hmm. Bera, Bera, the One Headed Troll by Eric Orchard. Now, Eric Orchard is a a an illustrator who has done other work. He has a picture book with Kate Inglis called If I Were a Zombie. And I haven't checked that one out, but I really would like to. And a wonderful book called Maddie Kettle, The Adventures of the Tim- Thimble Witch, which came out two years ago, which is a wonderful book. Probably the first time I met, encountered Eric Orchard's work is with um, a webcomic, and that was called The Situation. And that was written by one of my favorite prose writers, Jeff Vandermeer. Mm. And and, and that's really, really, it's the first time I encountered it. And I thought, wow, this, this guy's work is really, really odd and really strange, but really, really good. Uh, Orchard is a Canadian writer. And, you know, I, I hope to see more of his, his work. Now, Bera, our, our hero here, is a one headed troll. And from the title of one headed troll, we have to assume that there are trolls lurking around with more than one head. Exactly. And and Bera lives quietly with her owl friend Winslow, and Bera is just trying to tend her island pumpkin patch when she discovers a human baby, which seems totally out of place here. <laughs> and it seems that everyone wants the baby, but Bera is determined to keep the baby safe from mermaids, witches, 
a creature called the Cludy, the head witch of the Troll King, all kinds of other strange matters too. But, you know, Gwen, what I want to do first is I just want to read the first page, and it won't take very long. Sure. So so the very first page, we have this, this scene of of an island and, and other, other like, strange-looking land over the distance. And it says, somewhere north and east, there is a secret cove. And in that cove is a tiny island. And on that island lived a small troll with one head. <laughs> and then the voice says, Winslow, can you move the candle over this way? The small one-headed troll was the official pumpkin gardener of the Troll King. The pumpkins are so big this year, Bera. You must be the best gardener ever. And Bera says, I just have good soil and fair weather. But there are no kings or queens in this story. And it's just, I mean, from what I read, it doesn't really bring you the, the, the feel and the essence of it. But but from that, just that one page, you know, this is going to be a very different story and a very strange story. And, and then Gwen, I know we'll talk more about the color scheme and the art style. But, you know, this this is a really beautifully rendered, strange world. Uh, it's bizarre, but... You know, it's got art and a bizarre story that I think no that will fascinate young readers and, and old readers as well. That's true. The first two comics that we've talked about were both very colorful, right? Um, Varmints and mm-hmm. Quirk's Quest both have very bright primary colors for the most part um, with a lot of variation, whereas the world that um, Eric Orchard creates here, it's a it's a different world. It's a darker world, I think. Um, the color palette is is more muted and subdued. But like you, when I when I first read this book, I also did a little bit of research. And there was an interesting interview with Eric Orchard talking about his own um, experiences with depression and the way that that factors into his work. And I'd like to read just a little quote from an interview that he did with um, uh, Bridget Alverson, who's an awesome comics journalist. And this was for Comic Book resources in uh, uh, 2014. And he said, the people in my life who love me and art and the stories I've made keep me going. He says, it scares me to think of my life if I didn't have art. I don't dwell on it a lot, but it gives me a hopefulness and a buoyancy in life that carries me through. It makes sense of the terrible memories. Today is the today the worst is the depression and the pervasive sense of worthlessness I'm always pushing away. I find it hard to make friends because I feel different. When you grow up like that, you just feel separated from people, like you are a little too different to have close friends. But I still try and I still reach out to people. And this had a lot of resonance for me because he was also the memories he's referring to are that his mom suffered from um, schizophrenia, which um, is a disorder that is common in my family as well. And so I'm aware of that. And so I, I immediately felt a kinship with him. But then I started thinking about how his description of himself reminds me a lot of the description of Bera that you just read, because clearly she is a lovely person who is a little different. She only has one head, for instance, and we're given <laughs> to understand, I think, that maybe that's not typical. But right. she's but she's a very kind person. She's a very generous person. She she loves her job. It gives her a sense of buoyancy, I think, to, to echo um, Eric Orchard. And so she's an unlikely figure to be the protagonist protagonist of a major quest narrative and yet circumstances put her into that role and I think she handles herself beautifully. I do too. And and this is just a wonderful story and and I I, I echo everything that you said. And and you would think, you know, from the quote that you read from Orchard that this might be a depressing book, but it is certainly not. No. It is it is a joyful book. It 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 has so much humor in it. Um, I, I love the book, and there's so many, so many little priceless, funny little things that are there. One, one of the things is, a, is a, one of the sections where Bera needs advice, <laughs> so she decides to summon the ghost of her great, 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 great aunt Dota, and it's that scene is just priceless. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And then there's, there's, there's just so much, just little, little humor, just kind of sprinkled in here and there. At one point, Vera asks Winslow to find something for her in a book. And she says, turn to page 286. And then Winslow flat lifts up his wings and says, with what? <laughs> <laughs> 
So it it you can tell that they've got this this relationship, and it's it's a much different relationship than we see uh, with Opie and Ned in in Varmints. Mm-hmm. And and even though Bera and and Winslow are not siblings, you can tell that they have this this love for each other. And this this relationship that's developed over a long period of time, and and that's one of the things to me that that makes this book such a wonderful book because each one of them has the other, and each one of them understands the other, even when all of these other people don't understand them, and they, these other strange beings, they they have something together. Exactly, and in the, in an interview that I read with Orchard, he he listed Maurice Sendak as a major influence, and I really see that here, especially in the depiction of the human baby. And mm-hmm. it, this is a text, it reminds me a little, don't laugh, okay, go ahead and laugh. Did you ever watch the, the Munster series when you were a kid? Oh yeah, all the time. Okay, and you know how Marilyn, the niece, is like the beauty ideal for the late 1960s, early 1970s, but to the Munsters, she's just this strange looking thing, you know, that they feel sorry for because right. she doesn't look like a monster. And in a yeah. way, the human baby in this text... <laughs> <laughs> it just it, it looks like a Sindak character for sure in, in many ways, yeah, but yeah. it also just looks so interesting because it isn't monstrous. It just is this little tiny, cute, little round-headed thing, you know. Um, one of the biggest uh, jokes in the, in the comic that's so adorable is that um, they find out that human babies go to the bathroom and it's not the most lovely <laughs> thing and they've got to try and sort <laughs> that out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so there's there's all sorts of, of, as you said, humor along the way. But it's also a really beautiful text about someone who stays the course to try and do the right thing. And mm-hmm. gosh, I just did two cliches at once. I hope there's like, <laughs> does, is there like a prize for that? The cliche, the police, the, the cliche right. police are not. That's not right. Aren't around, listening today. So all okay. right, but yeah. but she's just. I'm trying not to give away the plot, honestly, and it's hard to talk about it without that. But but she's an amazing character, and by the end you see that um, you see that that she has managed not only to help someone else, but she has a new way of viewing herself and her relationship to others that's really positive. And so I found it to be just a really beautiful text. I did too, and, and you know we have really another quest story, just like we have with Quirk's quest. And again, this is a this is a different type of quest story. But the thing that impressed me, and I know we talk about this a lot about, you know, a writer or especially a creator like Orchard who writes and illustrates, um, you know, usually we see, uh, maybe not usually, but sometimes we see a strength in one side or the other. Maybe this creator is a slightly better writer than they are an artist or vice versa. Both, Both elements here are so strong. Orchard's writing is so, so well well done and his art is so well done it's it's really a it's really a balanced book i mean because he excels at both Mm -hmm. it's it's truly beautiful it's it's a work of art and it's also just the images have stuck with me um i could say that about all the books that we've talked about today and all of them really in their own way are quest narratives and i really Mm -hmm. like that type of text i suppose but there's something about Bera, the one-headed troll, that, that there's images that I can close my eyes and it's almost like I can see the book just right in front of me because they stuck in my mind so much. They, it's a really appealing text. Yes. This is, this is one that can be read and reread for many, many years. And don't you think it's pretty much for the whole range of our listeners? I could see a young child enjoying it, you know, perhaps being either reading with a parent or having the book read to that child. But I could also see middle grade and even high school students finding something in it that they would enjoy. Yeah, you know, and I was just wondering, because we have not received this at the library yet, whether this will be in the children's graphic novel section or the teen graphic novel section. Mm. Yeah, or maybe even the adult graphic. Well, novels. now we have a quest, Andy, to we find do out have a quest. <laughs> <laughs> the cataloging mystery. Gwen That's and right. Andy and the mystery of the of the catalog file. Well, 
Gwen, do you want to tell us about the last book that we'll be looking at from First Second today? I do. This is Drew Wang's The Creepy Case Files of Margot Malou. And it's actually a slightly differently shaped text. Um, first of all, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's come to us in hardcover. And it's about, I'd say, maybe seven inches by ten inches. It's on the, the horizontal. So it's a story that, that reads um, sort of... Um, in a, in a horizontal way more than a vertical way, and it's it's really enjoyable. So this is a book that when I was thinking about um, adjectives for it, I came up with three, suspenseful, rollicking, and thoughtful. And those words may never have been used together <laughs> about one text, <laughs> but they came immediately to mind after I finished the book. Andy, I've noticed that this text actually shares a lot of commonalities with Eric Orchard's book, and that both seek to provide alternative renderings of monsters. Mm -hmm. But with Wang, the, the genre is definitely mystery, and the text follows in a long line of children's mystery fiction from my personal favorite, Nancy Drew, um, The Hardy Boys, I was thinking of Encyclopedia Brown, and most mm -hmm. recently, Wendelin Van Dranen's Sammy Keyes series or Octavia Spencer's Randy Rhodes series. So, you know, that this is a, a, a genre of children's fiction that um, remains super popular, um, mystery series, and this one is that, but it has a lot of other things going on with it. And um, Andy, it started off actually as a webcomic in 2014, and even after receiving a contract um, for this text with First Second, um, the author chose to continue to finish it online. And he believes, and I believe too, that um, he has a lot of faith in his, his regular readers that they'll also want to buy the hardcover. But I'm always really excited when I learn that a book began as a webcomic because, as the author himself says, um, it means that the, the creator has gotten feedback along the way. Mm -hmm. and um and and has actually engaged with young readers as he's written the text. Well, I'll get right to the synopsis and we can talk about the book. So the creepy case files of Margot Malou features Charles Thompson, a young man from the suburbs who reluctantly follows his parents into the inner city where they are engaged in rehabilitating a former hotel into apartments. And although Mr. and Mrs. Thompson appear to be very progressive and um, aware of the thought... They're thoughtful about the impact of gentrification, which is what they're really engaged in. Charles himself has nonetheless accumulated a strong set of fears around urban living, and given that he and his family are white and the majority of their neighbors are not, this text enters into an interesting dialogue about what it means to be afraid, especially of people whom one might simply have never encountered." For, um, as it turns out, Charles does have something very much in common with the other kids in his new neighborhood. They are all afraid of monsters, and monsters appear to be lurking everywhere, from Charles's new apartment building to highway underpasses to the sewer system and other interesting hidden places where the reader ends up. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Charles wants to be an investigative reporter. In fact, the first thing he does when he gets in his new apartment, and this is dear to my heart and I'm sure to yours as well, Andy, is he unpacks his book collection yes. and is trying to decide how to order his books. So Charles is a very erudite young man and very interested in, in becoming a journalist. And this is what compels him, despite his many, many fears, to follow the, the youth detective, Margot Malou, on a series of increasingly intense cases. Um, one of the things I was thinking about, Andy, when, when I read this book was Zootopia, which is a very popular Disney film. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to see it when it came out this last year. I have not seen it yet. I recommend it, actually, because it has a lot of interesting things going on in it. And also the animation is really spectacular. But many of our listeners may have seen it. And it certainly has been talked about a lot. And in a way, this book is set up in a somewhat similar fashion, um, because both texts are really thinking about stereotyping and mm -hmm. about the assumptions that we have about people who we don't know. Um, many people have praised Utopia because it presents contemporary um, tensions surrounding issues of racism and diversity in the workplace. However, in telling their story, Disney's animators focus on the question of whether different races have certain predispositions towards, say, violence. And I'm going to leave a the fact that even the idea of race is culturally constructed and not even used by scientists or cult 
cultural anthropologists anymore, because I want to emphasize that via turning um, the characters into animals, which is what happens, I'm sure even the title Zootopia would tell you that, um, but even by turning every character into an animal and by bringing up a lot of stereotypes, one of the things that Disney does is it doesn't totally shut those stereotypes down. And so um, one film critic said about the film that, quote, um, it, it's a situation in which an anti-racist and a racist coming out of this film might leave thinking it validated their sense of how the world works. Now, I'm going to say that the creepy case files of Margot Malou actually addresses stereotypes and fears in two ways. First, it does so by featuring a powerful, non-white protagonist, Margot Malou, who is shrewd about human and monster motivation, <laughs> and who clearly has clout in three worlds, the world of kids, the world of adults, and the world of monsters. And those three worlds are very definitely delineated in this text and set apart. Um, <clears throat> but... Um, really, it's also interesting that the monsters are where Wang brings in a secondary way of addressing stereotypes and fears. He presents a complicated world of monsters, from trolls to gnomes to ghosts, and shows how their society struggles to exist when it is constantly being encroached upon by human beings. We are very pesky, as it turns out, we human beings. <laughs> um, this is one of the most interesting commentaries on gentrification and 21st century quote unquote progress that I've ever read, but I don't think that Wang is, is, co is sort of, um, um, I don't know. I don't think he's copping out by making the central conflict occur between human children and monsters. In fact, rather than tying things up neatly at the end of the text, say in a similar fashion that was handled by Disney's Monsters, Inc., this text leaves the reader with a sense that our actions have a number of ripple effects, some of them unintended. So I think this is a really sophisticated examination of um, basically 21st century questions and problems but I don't, I don't want our readers to think that just as with sort of Bera, the one-headed troll, where we said it sounds a little dark, but it's not, you know, it's actually quite funny and lighthearted in some ways. I would say the same thing about this book. This book is doing so many things simultaneously. It's like mm -hmm. the, it's, it's presenting the inter, inner life of Charles Thompson, but you also really get to understand how very smart and how very um, capable and amazing Margot Malou is. You, you meet a whole cast of characters. You, you get parent-child dynamics. It's just an amazing book. Boom. I, I think so, too. And, and Gwen, you're exactly right, because this, this book does work on multiple levels. There's there's so much going on. You can read it just as a straight mystery adventure story, and you're going to have a great time. But there is so much there that, that's beyond, you know, that's underneath the surface. And, and there's so many, like you said, there's so many great characters. And one of my favorites is Kevin. Yes. He's an African He's an African-American kid who gives Charles a business card early in the story for Margot, mm -hmm. and, and he says she's kind of a legend. They say monsters are afraid of her. And, you know, we, we see Kevin at other times, too. And, and um, the great thing about this book is, you know, as you mentioned early on, Charles has, has a fear of the city. And, you know, that happens with a lot of people. And, and to be honest, I, I have a fear of cities, too. And I have to constantly, you know, tell myself everything's going to be fine. There's really, you know, people are really pretty much the same. But but cities for Charles equals fear. And, and monsters have, you know, of course, feed on that fear. And when you have monsters, you have certain expectations about how monsters are going to 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 react, how they're going to behave. And, and again, this goes right into exactly what we were talking about, people that are different than we are. We have certain expectations, and they're usually prejudicial expectations. But Margot understands monsters, and as she said, she understands humans, kids, and adults. She's able to bridge that gap. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and this, this is a huge, huge thing, you know, especially to come out of a kid's graphic novel. I mean, you're talking about really global issues here. We're talking about uh, acceptance of other, other people of all kinds of differing, you know, ethnicities and all kinds of things. And, and here is, here is a girl, Margot, who's able to, to bring those people together and to get them. Basically, she's just trying to achieve understanding. And, and they, the, the, uh, Drew does this in such a great way. 
that it's funny, that it's adventurous, that it's a little bit scary. But like you said, there's so much stuff that's going on deeper beneath the surface that makes this just a a wow, drop your mouth, wide open comic. Well, and it's it, one of the things that he does particularly well is in a very economic way, he's really good at accruing details around a character so that you feel that you really have a deep insight, a sort of flash insight into the character. I feel that especially about Charles because, you know, the, the majority of the comic is focalized through him. So we, we understand mm-hmm. his point of view perhaps better than we do some of the other characters. But I will also say that Margot's way of handling everyone is to listen to them, to mm-hmm. really hear them, and then to help take them through to a place of understanding. And, you know, when, when the comic starts off, you get this idea of Charles as being um, sort of obsessed with his own life trajectory and becoming a journalist. And it, it, it's almost a single-minded obsession with him. And by the end of the text, there's something that he learns, which is so important for a reporter to understand. And that is that when he takes himself out of that starring role, when he stops caring about himself and his own fate and what happens to him, he learns that that is really sort of standing back and listening to others is the true path to success. And that's true as a person, not only, you know, as a journalist. And so you get this sense that Margot, once she understands that Charles wants to be a journalist, she helps lead him subtly, and it really is subtly, (laughs) through to this self-understanding without being preachy. And therefore, the text isn't preachy either. I I don't want to give off that impression, because it really isn't. I'm telling you, Disney movies are preachy, and I'm sorry, Disney um, you know, I, there are certain things I like about most Disney movies. There's always something to talk about with them. And in many ways, at least they're trying. But they yeah, have yeah. this mandate that their films need to end in, in, in not with a happy ending, certainly with a very tied up ending. That's part of the convention of creating popular blockbuster films for anyone, let alone children, right? But right. that's not the purview of this author, and therefore he's freed up, really, I think, to create characters whose realizations are um, subtle, and th- it, there's just a realism to this text that is breathtaking, even though we haven't talked about the illustrations yet, and they're quite fanciful and dramatic and colorful. So there's a lot to love about this book, not just the content, but just the visuals. Yes, and and that's one of the things that I'm glad you mentioned because the art is so wonderful. It it is, and and again, there's such a great use of of color as you mentioned of shadow because that's a very important element. Uh, anytime you're going to have a monster story, and you're investigating any of that, that's that's great too. But you know the characters are well drawn. It's a lot of it is is what. I mean, I don't mean to say they're simple line drawings, but they're very clear mm-hmm. line drawings, easy, especially with the the, the human characters, mm-hmm. easy to easy to read. Um, again, you mentioned the the layout of the book is a bit unusual, and it looks like, you know, if you look at each page, it looks like somewhat like you would see like in a Sunday newspaper comic strip. Mm-hmm. And and I know these were web comics, so that may be um, one of the reasons why it looks like that. But it does make it a a different reading experience and and a unique reading experience as well. Yeah, he tends to to usually have one panel predominate on a particular Mm -hmm. page, and then the other two panels are usually secondary to it. But right. there's there's a lot of action in this comic, but I will admit that that it was action that was pretty easy for me to follow. I I never was was confused, and it's very fast paced. In fact. <laughs> I've read this book more quickly than I wanted to. It's one of those comics where <laughs> you really wanted the book to last longer, but I, 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 I pretty much breezed through it. And I actually, I think I was telling you before the show that I'm going to use this comic in my class next semester because it dovetails nicely with actually another really popular set of books for young readers that I bet you're familiar with in your role as a librarian. One of them is Neil Gaiman's Coraline, 
Oh, sure. Right. Which is about a young girl who who is also trying to figure out who she is at at a very delicate point in time and and has a number of adventures to sort that out. But it also reminds me of a book um, by um, Fetterly called uh, uh, Better Nate Than Ever. And it's about a young man who is sort of like Charles has a deep desire, but his desire is to star on Broadway. But he's a very improbable physical specimen for Broadway. He's a, he's a young man. He's a bit overweight. He's got shocking hair. He's very intense and, and kind of always looks like his clothes have, have, are trying to leave him. And he's just a mess. <laughs> and But yet he has this amazing personality. And by, by observation and by meeting a couple of really key and influential people, um, characters, he's able ultimately to to make the, a big step towards achieving his dream. He reminds me so much of Charles Thompson. So I think I'm going to teach the three of these together. But what makes this book so exciting is so much of the energy and so much of the message is visual. And I think that teaching them together will allow my students to, to get an understanding of how uh, an artist uses visuals to tell the same story that in many ways print authors have been telling for a while in children's lit. But I think it's really just beautifully done. I'm very excited about this book. I am too. And, you know, this is probably the one that I'm going to reread the soonest because uh, of all the things that you mentioned. And it's just, it's just a great story. And there's so much, there's so much depth in it and so much, um, you know, so much to be enjoyed in it. Well, first, second, like I said, they've had a lot of things going on in their office with all these images up, um, monsters and quests and adventures and and horses that that are uh, smarter than people. (laughs) It's just, (laughs) I think it's probably been a lot of fun. But, you know, the quality of these texts, all four of them, underscores why I think first, second books is so respected in our field. I think so, too. And and we're just so glad that they are around and they keep producing these great books every month and we're we're delighted to be able to tell you about these four books and actually Gwen of all five books that we've talked about today including Mighty Jack four of them are available at impressive discounts at DCB service we have Robert Christie and Deborah Lang's Quirks Quest Into the Outlands at 11.89 that's 30% off the retail price Ben Hatke's Mighty Jack at 10.49, again 30% off. Andy Hirsch's Varmints at 11.89, 30% off as well. And Drew Wang's The Creepy Case Files of Margot Malou for 11.19, and again that book is at 30% off. And after you get your comics at DCB Service, get in touch with us and let us know what you think. You can contact us by going to our website at comicsalternative.com and on the right-hand side of your browser, you'll see a tab that reads Send Voicemail. Click on that and from the comfort of your own desktop or mobile device, you can send us a message through the wonders of SpeakPipe. Or if you want to be old school about it, you can contact us on the telephone <laughs> at 4153-COMICS. That's 415 326 Six four two seven, or if you want to contact us by email, you can do that at the number two guys at comicsalternative.com, or you can get in touch with us individually. I'm Wolverton at comicsalternative.com, and Gwen, how can people reach you? They can reach me at Gwen at comicsalternative.com. You can also find us on Twitter, where we announce new content to our podcast and updates to our blog. We are at the number two guys with PhDs. That's right. And you can also find us on Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google Plus, Goodreads, and Pinterest. And we even have a YouTube channel. So you can access us that way. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes. You can stream us on Stitcher. And you can find us on TuneIn. And you can discover every single one of our episodes, as well as our reviews and comics-related commentary on our blog at comicsalternative.com. And don't forget Spotify. 
and Spotify. It wouldn't be a podcast if I didn't forget something. And so (laughs) we're in good shape. That's right. (laughs) Well, until next time, I'm Andy. And I'm Gwen. See you soon. Bye-bye.